This is Space Time Series 27, Episode 111, for broadcast on the 13th of September 2024. Coming up on Space Time, evidence of an unexpected population of Kuiper Belt objects. A new study shows the Martian polar ice caps are not created equally. And Europe's new Artemis 3 service module, which will be used for man's return to the lunar surface, is now on its way to NASA. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. A new study has detected an unexpected population of very distant bodies in the Kuiper Belt. The findings, reported in the Planetary Science Journal of the American Astronomical Society and on the pre-press physics website archive.org, are based on data collected by NASA's New Horizons Kuiper Belt search team using the 8.2-metre Subaru telescope in Hawaii. The Kuiper Belt is a distant ring of icy objects, frozen debris and comets, which circles the Sun beyond the orbit of Neptune. But these new findings mean the Kuiper Belt may extend much further into deep space than formerly thought. Or alternatively, there's a second separate Kuiper Belt beyond the one observationally discovered back in the 1990s. It implies that the New Horizons spacecraft, which is now some 60 times further from the Sun than the Earth, hasn't yet left the Kuiper Belt as earlier thought. The study's lead author, Wes Fraser, from the National Research Council of Canada, says the solar system's Kuiper Belt long appeared to be very small in comparison with many other planetary systems. But these new results suggest that idea may simply have arisen due to observational bias. He says the Subaru observations searched down to fainter detection limits, finding a significant Kuiper Belt mass at 70 to 90 times further from the Sun than the Earth. So, if this new result's confirmed, it means the Kuiper Belt isn't all that small and unusual after all when compared to those around other stars. One possibility is that this new population of Kuiper Belt objects could simply be a dynamically resonant population with Neptune, gravitationally affecting these Kuiper Belt objects in just the right way to cause their orbital period to be a precise multiple of Neptune's orbital period. Alternatively, however, this new population of Kuiper Belt objects may challenge some aspects of current models of the solar system's formation, suggesting that the disk of protoplanetary material from which the solar system was formed must have been much larger than previously thought. This is space time. Still to come, the Martian polar ice caps found not to have been created equally after all. And the Artemis 3 service module, which will help power humankind's return to the moon's surface, now on its way to NASA. All that and more still to come on Space Time. A new study has confirmed that the Martian polar ice caps are evolving very differently from each other. People have observed the bright Martian poles wax and wane for centuries, but it's really only been in the last 50 years that scientists discovered that they're almost comprised completely of carbon dioxide, which is cycling in and out of the Martian atmosphere to the rhythm of the red planet's seasons. But this new study in the journal Icarus shows that exactly how this happens is a far more complex interplay of processes which scientists are only now starting to gradually tease out. The findings are based on observations by the High Resolution Imaging Experiment or HiRISE instrument on NASA's Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter spacecraft. It compared how the two Martian poles differ in their seasonal uptake and release of carbon dioxide. The study's lead author, Candace Hansen from the Planetary Science Institute, says the goal of the study was to shed light on the processes which shape the planet's surface as well as Mars's overall climate, since Mars cycles about a quarter of its atmosphere throughout the Martian year. Like Earth's 23.5 degree tilt, Mars also spins on a tilted axis, about 25 degrees, and so consequently it experiences seasons. But Mars has a much longer path around the Sun. It's also far more eccentric than the Earth. In other words, its orbit's far more elongated. Now, if Mars's path around the Sun was a perfect circle, then all of its seasons would be equally long. But its eccentricity situates Mars further from the Sun during the Southern Hemisphere autumn and winter, which is simultaneously the Martian Northern Hemisphere spring and summer. That makes these seasons for each hemisphere the longest for the planet. 
Another point to remember is that Mars's southern hemisphere is also significantly more elevated than the northern hemisphere, much of which is thought to have once been part of a great ocean. So ultimately, the southern autumn and winter on Mars bring about most of the freezing and lowest atmospheric pressure, since so much of the atmosphere is frozen as dry ice at this time. And these are the major drivers of the differences in seasonal behaviour of carbon dioxide between the two red planet hemispheres. Now, by contrast, the Martian northern winter is not only a lot shorter than the southern winter, but it also coincides with dust storm season. So as a result, the northern polar seasonal ice cap contains a much higher concentration of dust than the southern polar ice cap, making the ice less robust. And differences in the northern and southern polar terrains also impact how carbon dioxide, ice and gas escape the landscape. For example, in the southern hemisphere, black dust fans distribute across the landscape. A layer of carbon dioxide ice builds up in the southern hemisphere's autumn and over the course of the winter, it thickens and becomes more translucent. Then in the spring, the sun comes up and the light penetrates the ice layer to the bottom enough that it warms up the ground underneath the ice sheet. This warm ground then turns the carbon dioxide ice into a gas, a process called sublimation. Now this gas, being trapped under pressure, is going to look for any weak spots in the ice and then rupture through it like a champagne cork. As soon as it finds a weak spot, the ice ruptures and then gas rushes out to the break, carving the surface of the weak spot along the way. And that creates a network of gully channels that splay out across the landscape. These are called araniforms because of their spider-like appearance. Once the gas breaks through the ice, it blows dark dust into the atmosphere. It turns out that meteorology is really important in this picture as well. That's because from there, the dust is blown by whatever winds happen to be present, landing in a fan-shaped deposit. Geophysicist Hugh Kiefer first described this process in 2006. A few years later, Hansen followed up with her own model of the northern polar ice cap, which also displays these fans in the spring. She found that the same phenomena was occurring in the north, but rather than relatively flat terrain, these processes play out across sand dunes. Hansen says that when the sun comes up and begins to sublimate the bottom of the ice layer, there are three weak spots, one at the crest of the dune, one at the bottom of the dune where it meets the surface, and then the ice itself can crack along the slope. No araniform terrains have been detected in the north because although shallow furrows develop, the wind winds up smoothing the sand on the dunes. This is space time. Still to come, the Artemis 3 service module on its way to NASA to prepare for man's return to the lunar surface, and later in the science report a bit of good news with Australian HIV levels continuing to drop. All that and more still to come on space time. The European Space Agency's Artemis 3 service module, destined for use on the historic mission that will return humans to the lunar surface in 2026, has commenced its journey to the Kennedy Space Centre. It marks a critical milestone for the third European service module, ESM-3. The module was manufactured in Italy. It was then assembled at the Airbus factory in Bremen, Germany, with components sourced from over 20 companies across more than 10 European countries. It's now making its way to the Kennedy Space Center aboard the transport ship Canopy, a journey of approximately 12 days across the North Atlantic Ocean. The European Service Module is an essential component of NASA's Orion spacecraft. It provides power, propulsion and life support systems for the astronauts during their deep space mission to the Moon and back. This marks the third such module delivered by ESA and follows the successful Artemis 1 mission and ongoing preparations for Artemis 2. That'll launch next year on the first mission to take astronauts around the Moon since the days of Apollo. The journey of ESM-3 began in Turin at the Thales Alenia Space Facility, where the module's structural backbone was constructed. This complex structure supports 11 kilometres of wiring, 33 thruster engines, four tanks of propellant, as well as solar arrays that can generate enough electricity to power two homes. Following its final assembly in Bremen, the module's main engine, one with the legacy of nine space shuttle missions, was installed earlier this year. Upon arrival at the Kennedy Space Center, ESM-3 will be integrated into the crew module adapter and then the crew module itself. Extensive testing will then follow to ensure everything is in readiness for the Artemis 3 mission, which aims to land astronauts on the Moon near its South Pole sometime in 2026. 
It'll be the first time humans have returned to the lunar surface in over 50 years. This report from ESA TV. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. For over 50 years, we've been inspired by the first humans to walk on the moon. Now the European Space Agency and NASA are working together on a modern-day version of the Apollo program. Called Artemis, it will put astronauts back on the lunar surface. The Apollo missions have mainly landed in the illuminated equatorial area of the moon, but there are much more interesting areas to be explored, like the poles and like the dark side of the moon. The today most visible European contribution to lunar exploration programs is the ESA-developed service module, the propulsion and power module of the Artemis crew module. The European Service Module, or ESM, is the heart of the Artemis spacecraft. It will provide electricity, water and air to NASA's Orion crew capsule, as well as maintaining temperature for life support. Its engines will provide propulsion and navigation control for the journey to the moon and back. ESA's industrial partner Airbus has already built two service modules for Orion, with hardware from companies throughout Europe. Artemis III will see a woman and a man walk on the lunar surface, continuing where the Apollo program left off half a century ago. We have companies in 10 countries helping to put this ESM together, and actually there are hundreds and thousands of people working within Airbus, but all in our partner companies to make this endeavor a successful mission. This joint step towards revisiting the lunar surface will continue the long-standing tradition of international cooperation in space. Space is one of the best examples for international cooperation uh, in terms of science and technology. Our ISS is a multinational project and uh, we've seen a lot of projects there that really bring together the whole community in terms of um, space and exploration and um, to do this work together as scientists working on the same aim, uh, working for mankind. The next two flights of the Artemis program will be crewed lunar missions with power, propulsion and life support also provided by the second and third European service modules. The moon is really our eighth continent and uh, it's there to be discovered. Astronauts, engineers and scientists are very excited to go to the moon because it's uh, pure exploration. It's uh, discovering terra incognita. We would go to regions that were never been well explored by a human, uh, neither robotically nor in person. And in that report from ESA TV, we heard from Nico Detman, Head of Development of Human Robotic Exploration with the European Space Agency, as well as Andreas Hammer, Head of Development and Human Robotics Exploration with Airbus, Klaus Peter Wilsch, the Chair of the Aviation and Space Group in the German Bundestag, and ESA astronaut Alexander Gerst. This is Space Time. And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with the Science Report. New research has detailed how the highly pathogenic avian flu virus H5N1 has spread rapidly into wildlife on South Georgia Island off the coast of mainland Antarctica, as well as the Falkland Islands further north. The findings reported in the journal Nature Communications claims the fragile ecosystem of the islands had been free of the virus until it was first detected there during the summer of 2022-23. Genetic assessment found the virus had spread from South America, likely through migratory birds, and infected a range of local birds such as black forehead albatross, skuas, kelp gulls and even two seal species. However, based on their findings, the authors say there's no clear evidence that the virus is adapting to be better at infecting mammals. A new study has concluded that New Zealand's first animal species were likely kakapo, small wrens, bats and freshwater limpets, rather than more recent Australian immigrants like kiwi birds, giant moa and takake. The findings reported in the journal GeoBios are based on detailed studies by paleontologists following some two decades of groundbreaking research at the St. Bethan's fossil site in central Otago. 
Their new paper summarises the extraordinary creatures that have been discovered at the dig site since 2001, including a giant parrot, two mystery mammals, as well as flamingos, a three-metre crocodile, a giant horned turtle and a giant bat. It also reveals that birds once thought to be the oldest representatives of New Zealand fauna, like kiwi and moa, are in fact more recent arrivals from across the ditch in Australia. A new study has confirmed that over the last decade, HIV diagnoses in Australia have continued to follow a downward trend despite an isolated increase last year. The findings are based on new data from the Kirby Institute at the University of New South Wales, which show that overall HIV diagnoses have reduced by over a third over the last decade, with diagnoses dropping by almost two-thirds among Australian-born gay and bisexual men. But in 2023, 722 new HIV diagnoses were reported. That's up from 553 in 2022. But it was still a lower number of annual cases compared to pre-pandemic levels. However, in the past 10 years, diagnoses have increased slightly among people living with HIV acquired through heterosexual sex and among people born overseas. The data also shows that HIV cases have remained stable among Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And time now for what must be the silliest story of the week. Paranormal investigator Ron Halliday has put his own spin on Eric Von Daniken's Chariots of the Gods claims that aliens built the pyramids, instead claiming that two famous Scottish archaeological sites on Orkney were intended as protection from nuclear war in a battle with aliens. And it's not just the north of Scotland. Halliday and colleagues think monoliths and monuments dotted across the British Isles could also have been built to fend off extraterrestrial terror. Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptic says, as with all good UFO theories, Halliday insists there's been a massive cover-up. Ancient monuments in Scotland, there has been a suggestion by one particular paranormal investigator that various ancient monuments in Scotland have actually been put up there to protect us from nuclear war and as indication of an ancient battle with aliens. Now, the interesting thing is the two sites that are named in this article are Scarabray and Maze Howe, both of which in Orkney on the islands is north of John O'Groats, not the mainland Scotland. And as it happens, I've been to both of those places and I've got a little brochure right in front of me, actually, about Scarabray and Maze Howe. And neither of them <laughs> look particularly suitable to protection from nuclear war or as indication of an ancient battle with aliens. Scarabray is an excavated village, almost like a whole lot of little houses that were built into a dune, in a way, or some sort of hillocky area near the water. And they sort of join up together. There's little paths between them, but it's really almost like it's a very, very big house or a lot of little houses and they're joined together. It was covered by the sand. Eventually people left. People found something else better to do, somewhere better to live than in the top of Orkney where it's very cold and windy. So they abandoned this place and it got covered in sand and was discovered later on. and dug up. No indication of anything, any nuclear war about it or battle with aliens. Maze Howe is one of those hillock tombs. Very big one, very good one. It's an enormous sort of uh, dome-shaped hill, man-made, with a tomb inside it. One of those ones that lines up with winter solstice, sun, dawn coming in through one hole in the building. That doesn't look particularly... It looks probably could look like a bit of a bunker. Wouldn't fit a lot of people in, though, I must admit. If you're having a nuclear war, you would not going to save most of your population in there. And no indication of ancient battles with aliens. The story sort of talks about carvings of people look like they're running away from something, which could be true. We're talking about 5,000 years ago. So, so, so these things were Vikings. It's a bit earlier than Vikings, yeah, like about sort of 4,000 years. Yeah, these are old, old, old things, ancient, Neolithic civilizations, etc. And Maze Howe, though, does actually have Viking writing in it, almost graffiti, actually, you could say that uh, it was apparently a lot of people coming back from the crusade. Sven was like, here. Sven was here, yeah. It's it, very close to that, actually, saying that uh, someone was here. And one of them said, uh, my wife is very beautiful and had a picture of a dog. <laughs> there is a famous lion drawing. There's a bird or perhaps an otter or something. There's, there's different drawings. And things, but these were done later, like, you know, 4,000 years later. Definitely not of the time that Mays Howe was built. Um, and they are basically graffiti from uh, soldiers returning from the crusade. It's a strange theory that a nuclear war obviously involves aliens and that sort of stuff, aliens having special technologies and things. But these particular ancient monuments, or ones a village, show no indication at all of any of this stuff. No radioactive so, fallout? No, nothing. Sand <laughs> has filled these things, certainly filled Scarabray. Obviously, as they say, it's all covered up. In these two booklets that I happen to have on these two sites, none of them mention nuclear war or ancient aliens. That's Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics.
that's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favorite podcast download provider, and from Spacetime with StuartGary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Space Time store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Space Time patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.